No one gave a speech like my dad. With his beautiful baritone voice, his sense of humor, and his impeccable timing, my dad held an audience in the palm of his hand. Speeches were such a major part of his life that he told us that when it was his turn to go up to what he called that great political rally in the sky, he wanted us to bury him with his podium. He had a unique style, which included telling stories that he honed over the years. My favorite was of a former conservative prime minister who, at a formal dinner, had insisted on a second pat of butter for his bread. Despite the waiter's insistence on adhering to the rule of one pat of butter per person, Mr. Diefenbaker thundered, excuse me, but do you know who I am? I am the Prime Minister of Canada, and I would like another pat of butter, please. My father grinned as he delivered the waiter's response. Do you know who I am? I'm the person who hands out the butter. <laughs> My dad told this and other stories not just to get a laugh, but to make the point that the man who hands out the butter matters just as much as the Prime Minister. Because to Dad, everyone mattered. The prophet Isaiah said, Consider the rock from which you were cut, the quarry from which you were dug. While my dad's Irish heritage was the rock from which his character was cut, Becomo, Quebec, his hometown, was the quarry from which it was dug. At Becomo, le travail acharné Becomo, était un mode de vie. Hard work was a way of life. Malgré des moyens limités, despite limited means, my grandparents had decided that there would be no limits on what their son could do. Mais tout ne fut pas facile. But it was not all easy. His life could have taken a completely different direction. At the age of 16, when the family's financial situation was particularly difficult, my father suggested to his father that he enroll in the plant's apprenticeship program. There's no doubt he would have had a good life, but he would not have seen through his destiny. My grandfather knew that and he declined his offer. Rather, he decided to extend his working days so that his son could go to university. Aware of this privilege, my father made it his duty to honor the sacrifices that allowed him to serve causes bigger than himself. My grandfather passed away when my father was only 25 years old. From that moment on, he took care of the family, looking after his mother, brother, and sister. While his career as a lawyer was taking off, he met the love of his life. His greatest advisor and his partner for what mattered most in his eyes, family and politics. In perfect harmony, together, they came together and brought these two passions successfully together. There was a destiny attached to my father that even in his youth, no one could deny. Even Prime Minister Diefenbaker, at the peak of his powers, wrote a letter to my grandfather extolling his son's potential after his first encounter with my dad. When I was a little girl, I had a sense that my father was a great man. He seemed to know everyone. They knew him, and they wanted to be around him. Prime Minister Clark attended Mark's christening. My dad did important work 
like serving on the Cliche Commission and leading an international mining company. And in what, to my very young eyes, seemed like the pinnacle of importance, Dad acted as Grand Marshal of the Montreal St. Patrick's Day Parade. My dad went on to win the leadership of the Progressive Conservative Party. When asked to comment on the significance of his election on the night of his victory, my father's first response was not what the journalists expected. It's Caroline Mulroney's ninth birthday, he exclaimed, on national television. At a moment of great achievement, he showed the country what his family meant to him. He became a truly great prime minister and a world leader. But to us, he was more than that. He was a truly great father. As his only daughter, he always made me feel special. He was the one who carried me to bed and stayed with me when I fell asleep until I fell asleep when I was little. The one who let me cry on his shoulder even when my tears ruined his beautifully pressed shirts when I was a teenager. And the one who waited for me at our table at our restaurant in New York City when I worked there, patiently reading his stack of newspapers until I arrived, always with a glass of champagne waiting for me. Every day of my life, my dad told me that I was the greatest daughter that God put on this earth. Now, we all know how much he liked hyperbole. But how lucky am I that for almost 50 years I was told something so wonderful every single day. He gave me love, confidence, and strength. Spending time with him was a joy. We would sit in his den and talk for hours. The news was always on in the background, and we would discuss it for sure, but mostly we talked about life. He set no course for his children other than to support our dreams, aspirations, and happiness. But he didn't always make it easy. When Andrew asked my father for my hand in marriage, Andrew said, Mr. Mulrooney, I would like to ask your permission to propose to Caroline. My father looked at Andrew and asked, propose what? <laughs> my decision to enter politics was a thoroughly discussed topic. My father was not immediately in favor of the idea because he knew well the hardships of being the man in the arena. I leaned on him for political advice. Now, Caroline, he cautioned me, because you are my daughter, people will ask you to do lots of things, fundraisers here, events there. But do not forget the three most important things. You're riding, you're riding, you're riding. The people of York Simcoe elect you, put their faith in you, and it is to them that you are accountable. Au fil des ans, Son instinct politique Over the years, his political instincts never lost their sharpness. He advised me not to deteriorate my political capital for minor issues, but to conserve it for issues and matters that truly were important. He would often repeat to me, life is short, but our heritage and legacy lives on. His words were a great support and comfort to me, especially when I was conferred the francophone file for the Ontario government. For the challenges I faced, my father encouraged me to stay the course and to put into practice one of his favorite political maxims. De lever un coin du rideau de l'histoire. To peek around the corner of history. Marchant sur les pas de celui qui a défendu les droits des minorités Walking in the steps of someone who defended the rights of francophones as soon as he entered parliament. I was entrusted with the duty of protecting the francophone minority in Ontario.
my brothers could recount stories just as remarkable as my own. My dad was immensely proud that his sons had built careers that they loved. He took such great joy watching Ben take center stage on TV, and he loved hearing him on the radio. He marveled at how Mark climbed his way up the corporate ladder, and later in life, Dad relied more and more on Mark for counsel, which was such a compliment to Marco. And Nicholas amazed my father as he took a leap to follow his dream, become an entrepreneur, and build a successful company. All three of them have matured into wonderful, loving fathers in our dad's image. My dad frequently told me how proud he was of them and the family lives that they built, which he said is the most important thing in life. He relished his role as papa to 16 grandchildren. He was playful and affectionate. He spoiled them with so much candy. <laughs> he played with them in the pool and he showered them with encouragement and love. My father was also a sincere and faithful friend, even though his Irish charm attracted everyone to him. He always remained faithful to his friends in good times and when storms blew through. This is why his friendships were so deep and long-lasting and an integral part of his life. This loyalty was also reflected in the deep respect that he always had for Quebec. It will be of no surprise to anyone when I say that Canada was in his skin, but his conception of Canadian federalism was a pluralist one. The distinct nature of Quebec was important to him, and despite the fact that his four children and 16 grandchildren live elsewhere, he never lost the spirit of the province he came from. Quebec was his home. No matter the crisis he was facing, or wherever he was around the world, there was never a day, not one, when my brothers and I did not speak with our father. Sweetie, it's your old daddy calling, he would say. Thousands, thousands of people have shared stories about his phone calls. They said that they, have, that they felt that they had been touched, not just, just by someone who changed the course of history, but by an exceptionally kind, thoughtful, and generous person who often reached out when they needed to be lifted up. My dad saw the world in a bigger way than most. His humanity defined him, which is why he transcended politics and connected with people in a way that left an indelible mark on their hearts and souls. In our grief, our family is comforted and so grateful for the universal outpouring of affection and admiration for what my father meant to them and to Canada. While he didn't care for polls, he did like good headlines. And those of the past few weeks would have pleased him immeasurably. He didn't build a tight-knit family or achieve what he did in politics on his own. He did it all, every step of the way with my mother. He fell head over heels for her beauty, but he loved her strength. Your mother is a fighter, he would tell us. He marveled at her street smarts, valued her loyalty, and respected her judgment implicitly. Theirs was a true and equal partnership. Together for 51 years, they were a political powerhouse. They achieved the unimaginable in their private and public lives because they did everything together. On his last day, my dad called out to my mother from his hospital bed and said, 
Mila, what have you got lined up for me today? <laughs> Mom leaned over his bed and said, Darling, what would you like me to line up for you? Notten, he replied, which was his funny way of saying the word nothing. <laughs> then I will line up Notten, she said. Ever hopeful, Mum put her hands on his cheeks and said, Oh, Brian, are you coming back to me? His body was tired, but his heart would not let him give us up. So Dad looked at Mum, and with what were his final words to her, he said, I plan to. We are heartbroken by our loss. We adored him. I miss you, Daddy. <laughs>